Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Wednesday, February 17th, and we are continuing our consideration on H-133, an act relating to emergency relief from abuse orders and relinquishment of firearms. Uh, today, we are going to be looking at a proposed amendment um, that uh, the language um, was discussed last time we discussed this bill, and this was a proposal from um, Judge Grierson, and he'll be talking about it a little bit later um, in terms of placement of the, of the original language of the, of the bill, and Eric will do a walkthrough um, in just a moment. I am assuming that everybody has a copy of the um, proposed amendment? I do not. You, you don't? Okay, so let's see. Thank On you. our committee page. Mm -hmm. I think you have to refresh. I just did. Maxine, is it draft 1.1? Is that the one? Yes. And again, this is a proposed amendment. Uh, I have it. Here's Barbara. So, anyway. Okay. Tom and Bob, do you, do you have it? Yes. I have it, yep. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Good morning, Felicia. Good morning, everybody. Okay, so Eric, turn to you. Good morning. Thank you. And if you could do a, a walkthrough, that'd be great. Thank you. Sure. Happy to. Good morning, everybody. Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, here to walk the committee through uh, a strike call amendment to H-133, as Representative Grad mentioned, it's an act relating to emergency relief from abuse orders and relinquishment of firearms. Uh, this was discussed by the committee at the last, the last time we got together on this bill, and there's a proposal from Judge Grierson that I modified a little bit into the amendment that we'll look at today. Uh, just a quick moment of background. You remember we're dealing with emergency relief from abuse orders, emergency RFAs. These are orders that the court can issue uh, when it finds that, they're, that the defendant has abused the plaintiff in the past and that there's an immediate danger of further abuse. So those two findings are required, past abuse, immediate danger of future abuse. The plaintiff has to, has to submit an affidavit in connection with, uh, with the petition, the complaint filed with the court. Uh, and if the court does issue this RFA, the emergency relief from abuse order, they can put restrictions on the defendant's behavior, some restrictions on what the defendant can do. As introduced, you remember H-133 as introduced, it added uh, to that sort of list of restrictions that the court can put on the defendant's behavior, a requirement that they would have to relinquish uh, firearms that they possessed or that another person possessed on, on their behalf. So the amendment that you're looking at now has that same concept in it. That it's the same idea that that the uh, order, this RFA, this emergency RFA, can include a provision requiring relinquishment of firearms from the defendant. It's just that there's been some changes to it, uh, and I can go through those when we do the walkthrough. But that's the big picture. So the, the relinquishment piece is still there. Language is very similar, in fact, uh, but uh, I'll note the changes when I do the walkthrough just now. So what I'm going to do uh, with that in mind is share the screen, but if anyone has any um, questions as I... Um, can you make me a co-host, please, uh, Evan? Thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions as I'm getting to the document, please jump in and, and or even as I'm doing the walkthrough, as I uh, often say, I can't see people raise their hands. So um, just jump right in if, if uh, any questions come up. So here's the, the uh, committee strike through amendment. You see it's dated yesterday. Uh, the, if you have the right version, as Representative Burdett was saying, it's 1.1 um, dated yesterday at 1.18 p.m. The uh, amendment, we're still in the same statute, which is the emergency relief, the emergency RFA statute. That's existing law that you're looking at right now at subsection A. And you'll see that what I, I mentioned in my introduction just now, you'll see right there that these RFA orders can be issued, this is lines 10 and 11, ex parte, that means they're uh, issued without notice to the defendant, and the defendant is typically not present, it's just the plaintiff 
coming in um, on, on their own. And you see in line 11, the, the findings that the court has to make that the, that the defendant abused the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children or both. So there has to be that finding of past abuse that I mentioned. Uh, continuing on line 12, plaintiff has to submit an affidavit in support of the order. So there has to be this finding of past abuse, an affidavit. There's some other language about particular procedures for minors, but we can pass over that for now. Um, and then we get into uh, line 15, you say relief under this section is limited as follows. So these are the particular types of relief that can be provided. And you'll see now we start subdivision one begins with some introductory language there upon a finding that there's an immediate danger of further abuse. So um, that's the other point I mentioned. Not only does there have to be past abuse, there has to be a finding of an immediate danger of further abuse. And if that's the case, the court makes that finding then you have a, a list here of uh, components that can be included in this order that would, as I say, restrain the, the defendant's behavior. You see, this is all existing law still, subdivision A, to refrain from abusing the plaintiff for their children or um, cruelly treating any animals. Subdivision B, refrain from interfering with the plaintiff's personal liberty or the liberty of the children, that's movement, that sort of thing, uh, or uh, coming within a fixed distance is subdivision C, the order can provide that the defendant has to stay uh, away from the defense, uh, sorry, away from the plaintiff uh, from a certain distance away. And, and no contact orders as well can be included. That's in subdivision D. Plaintiff, the defendant can't contact the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children as well in any Eric, way. Yeah. Eric, yeah, I just had a question on uh, um, everything here is existing law, right? For the most part. Uh, uh, so far, yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I don't know if it's been discussed in the past. It's really got nothing to do with what we're doing right now. But so uh, there's a distance uh, um, thing put in sometimes where the fixed distance. So what happens if they just happen, uh, two people, the two people just happen to show up, say, at the local farmer's market? And it's it's a totally by accident. Nobody's, you know, stalking anybody, <laughs> planning anything. My understanding of those situations is, is that, uh, you know, they're discretionary on the part of the uh, state's attorney that, that doesn't require that a charge be brought for violating an order for various accidental or inadvertent of the of the uh, no contact or distance requirements. Uh, sorry, I meant distance, not no contact. Um, and that if it's a situation like that, that there's discretion on the part of uh, the parties themselves and the state's attorney to, to not bring the charge. And, uh, so, if it, so if if the person who's been charged or not charged, but I guess accused of abuse at this point, that they uh, they wouldn't have to leave necessarily. Uh, I think that that I'm gonna. I think the the practitioners in this area would would have a better sense of how that happens on the ground than I would. Uh, right. But I think I think that there is probably if the people bump into each other inadvertently, for what I've heard anecdotally, there is a requirement that they that somehow the both of them work out uh, putting that distance into place somehow. Okay. All right, great, thank you. Sure. Uh, so as you were mentioning, Representative Burdett, so far we, we've been looking at, this is all existing law, but you see the proposal of new law to add to this existing list is in subdivision E that starts on line 12 with the underlying language. So you've got A through D of components that can be in the court's order now. This proposal is to add the relinquishment I'm just going to skip ahead for a second before we even look at the substance to show you the first change here. Because you remember then after the E, there was a subdivision two and a subdivision three. Under H133, as introduced, right here on page three, line four, that's where uh, the new language was and the bill was introduced. So it didn't come under that subdivision one. It was its own new paragraph, new paragraph four, having to do with firearms relinquishment specifically. Now that relocating uh, of the language, which is what this proposal does. It brings it into subdivision E here. That means that it falls under this introductory language that I mentioned on page one, this uh, line 17 and 18. It now it comes within that requirement. So he, now that, and yet you will recall, that requires that there has to be a finding that there's an immediate danger of further abuse. So now uh, that applies to, to the firearms relinquishment language as it's proposed to be uh, relocated into this new subdivision E. It didn't apply before because it was its own separate paragraph. Now there were other components of the language at the time that required findings by the court, and I'll get into those in a minute, but the, uh, 
the language as it was located at that time didn't fall under this one. So it didn't actually uh, require this immediate danger finding. And now it does. So uh, that's, the, that's the effect of relocating the language here to E. So having said that, let's look at the language itself. And you'll see uh, that actually the first oh, two and a half lines or so are exactly the same as it was in the H-133 as introduced. That's, uh, or I should say that language was exactly in the original bill as well. And that's uh, that the court can require the defendant to immediately relinquish until the expiration of the order. So it's not permanent. The relinquishment is only in effect as long as the relief from abuse orders in, in effect. Uh, and you'll recall that these orders are 14 days maximum unless, and then at that time a final order can be, uh, can be issued by the court. But these emergency orders are 14 day uh, time limited. So the relinquishment can be ordered uh, and not only for firearms that are in the defendant's possession, ownership or control, that's line 13, or that another person possesses or controls on behalf of the defendant. And that's the same language that was in 133 as it was introduced. There's two changes to the language though, one an addition and one a subtraction. The addition you'll see there at line 14 now, and to refrain from acquiring any firearms while the order is in effect. So the idea there is that you, you relinquish what you may what you have, and, and you see the refrain uh, language there is deliberately chosen to be consistent with, remember I mentioned these A, B, C, and D that you already have use that same phrase, to refrain from contacting, refrain from coming within a distance of the plaintiff. So the idea is to parallel that language, make it consistent with what you have in existing law in terms of how it's written. So, but the idea is refrain from acquiring firearms in, in the future while the order is in effect. Again, only while the order is in effect, um, when the order expires, then the uh, requirement goes away. So that's one change. Uh, Excuse, me, the, Eric? Yeah. Excuse me, Eric. Yeah. Um, Eric, I see that um, Ken's hand is up and then, um, and then I have a question. So Ken, go ahead. Thank you. Can't hear you, Ken. I think Barbara was before me to be fair. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Barbara. I don't. I didn't see your hand. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Okay. I think mine is a quick question. Thanks, Ken. So, Eric, I just want to make sure that I understand if there was not um, past abuse of an affidavit cannot state that, but there is danger of abuse. This whole act would not apply to that person? Um, I, I think I'm understanding you, Representative Richardson. Are you saying that that if there's no immediate danger of, no. of further abuse, then this wouldn't apply? No, I'm saying, let's say there has not been past abuse, but there is danger of imminent abuse. Is that a different law that would be followed? Because it sounds like this one wouldn't apply. Uh, yeah, you, you you might conceivably be able to get a stalking order or a a a restraining order generally based on on some immediate danger to the person, and that would fall under sort of the court's general authority to to issue restraining orders in emergency situations. But you're right that without that past abuse, this this statute, this law would not apply. So we don't always know about the past abuse. Sometimes we don't know until something bad happens and then, you know, the former neighbor says, you know, he's shot my dog or so if somebody is in a relationship with someone, the person gets abuse of or starting to get abuse of the um, the abuse, the person who's being um, who's seeking this order doesn't know that this person's ex-girlfriend also had a like there's no way to find that out or if so, like when you're in that dangerous situation, there's sort of a burden on the person to go figure out if this person might have been abusive with other people. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I follow the question, sorry. So it may be the first time in this relationship that somebody is in danger of abuse. 
but they don't know necessarily that the person that they are fearing may have had a history of it, but we don't necessarily always know that. And it might be hearsay and it would be hard to file an affidavit saying, you know, I know this person beat up their last three wives. Yeah, and that even if that were the case, that the statute still wouldn't apply because if you see on, on lines 11 and 12 of existing law, there has to be, the, the allegation has to be the defendant has abused the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children. A, a, a past abuse of another person uh, wouldn't qualify you for this RFA either. So is it sort of fair to liken this to every dog gets a free bite? I leave those sorts of characterizations to you folks. I, I, I don't. All right, thanks. Okay, before um, I go to Ken, I just want um, to mention that um, that uh, Commissioner Sherling is going to be um, coming in. He's got a very narrow um, window, so I will uh, I'll break to um, to let him testify. Uh, but in the meantime, go ahead, Ken. I'll I'll, I'll wait then because uh, if that's the case, my my questions um, can wait, and I'll have a lot of them, and I'll listen to the witnesses. Thank you. Okay, well, he's not here yet. So <laughs> so if you wanna- We got witnesses and everything, but I'll, okay. I'll just wait. It's not, I can wait. Thank you. Okay, all right. Well, this is the time to ask Eric questions about the language. Um, Eric, okay, I... then I will. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Okay, so going back to uh, line 12, the new language, that's a really, broad scope of, of, of things, isn't it? That, that a person is in a lot of control that probably isn't, that could be really, really drawn out in the courts. I mean, for example, wh whether, whether uh, a person is actually <laughs> has control over a firearm that maybe someone else is possessing on their behalf? Exactly. Control that another person possesses. I mean, how how would you ever how would you ever prove that or controls in behalf of the defendant? I mean, how would you ever prove that? Well, I think the I think you're right that that's a that's an issue that uh, could well be litigated and disputed in court. Uh, but it's also true that, you know, just that there could be an easy example of that, you know, not to say that the easy ones are the ones that get litigated, of course they don't, but, but an easy example that you could prove is, for example, the person uh, uh, doesn't want to have to relinquish their firearm, so they give it to their friend and say, you just hold on to this for me for a while. And, right. you know, that's, that's an easy one where the, obviously the person owns it and the other person's doing it on behalf of the defendant. Um, but you're right, there might be other situations where it's less clear and that, that could be uh, uh, argued in court. But the, but the word control in there is, is also a, a big, powerful uh, word. But I'll, I'll, I'll stop now, Eric, because I see the commissioners on and uh, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Sure. Great, thank you, Ken. And also um, we can ask uh, Judge Grierson some of those questions as well. Uh, so, good morning, Commissioner. Thank you for that. Should, should I, sorry to interrupt, uh, Representative Grad, should I stop screen sharing so you can see the Commissioner? What would you prefer? <laughs> um, yes, thank you, if that's... Sure, yep. yeah. I can come back to it uh, okay. in, once we uh, hear from the witness. There we go, okay. Good, Great. Thank good morning, so Madam Chair. Yeah, good morning. So thank you so much. I know that you have a very um, tight schedule. I appreciate you being here. So I'm going to interrupt um, our walkthrough and um, invite you to, to make any comments. Thank you. Sorry about uh, interrupting the walkthrough. Uh, Eric does such a nice job with that. I, I missed the front end. Um, for the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, we were in, invited back. Uh, under, uh, I did read the um, uh, what appears to be one update to the bill um, that was made and shared uh, yesterday. Um, I'll be uh, quite brief, uh, just reiterate uh, our support for the bill and our um, 
commitment to ensure that any issues related to storage that the uh, the Department of Public Safety is willing to uh, step in and help uh, any agency that has issues that relate to um, evidence or firearm storage uh, to mitigate those issues to the greatest uh, extent possible. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, Barbara, I see your hand is up. So Commissioner, good morning. Um, I'm wondering, um, I just asked Eric a question and want to make sure that we have other means of protecting people who wouldn't fall under this um, bill, should it be passed, because they can't um, prove past abuse, but they are in what they believe is imminent danger of abuse. Um, I apologize. I'm coming in midstream, so I don't have the context of that question. I, I, I'm not sure I understand um, the full scope. So in this um, amendment, um, somebody has to file an affidavit um, in order to be eligible uh, stating past abuse from the person they're seeking relief from abuse from. And, and they have to show they're in um, danger of further abuse. So I'm wondering about the first time somebody is having uh, imminently dangerous situations with somebody, do we have a law other than this that would provide these kinds of protections to that person? Or are we just cutting those people out at this point? I may defer that to uh, either a member of the judiciary if they're on or to Major Jonas for that sort of operational um, level uh, assessment. It's been a little while since uh, I was on the, it's been a long while since I was on the street having to, uh, to implement these things on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Uh... I'm seeing any other hands. I want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Um, Judge Grierson? I just, uh, am I on here? Am I here with him? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. I, I think I can clarify the, the issue that, that Representative Rachelson has been raising. You, you have to look at the definition of abuse under the statute, and it doesn't have to be past abuse as she's used that term. You look under definitions at Section 1101, abuse. And then they define what abuse can mean. And it can be uh, attempting to cause or causing physical harm. I think that's what Representative Rachelson is talking about. But under Section B, it's placing another in fear of imminent serious physical harm. So if, if that's what the evidence is coming in, there is a basis for the court to grant a, 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 a temporary restraining order based on, on that, as opposed to a finding that the phys I think what Barbara, uh, Representative Rachelson is talking about is evidence of physical harm in the past. It doesn't have to be that. I, I hope that clarifies it. Thank you. Great, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions for the commissioner? No. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate you taking time out to be here. Thank you. Thank you for the flexibility and timing. Great. Absolutely. Okay, Eric, thanks. Thanks so much, Eric. Sure, so I'm gonna uh, bring the uh, amendment back up. Right, and I did have a question, Eric. Sure. Um, Okay, so the language talks about refrain from acquiring. What, what does that mean? Does that mean purchase? Does that mean borrow? Yes, I, th I think acquiring is broad. It can refer to any way that the, that the um, point of, sorry, defendant would obtain possession of the firearm. 
Yeah. And do we have that, is that language elsewhere or? Uh, no, nope, I think it's just here. So I think it's, it'd be one of those, uh, in terms of interpreting the term, which I think is kind of what, what you're asking about. I think it would be uh, a plain language approach. Acquiring the, is a broad, uh, broad word. So it would include any, any method that the defendant acquired it, whether it be purchase, by borrowing it from somebody else, by somebody else giving it to them. Um, I, think it would, I think it's understood to be broad enough to include those, those fact patterns. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. So uh, getting back to, to the walkthrough though, that you'll see, so we were talking about what is in the bill and I mentioned that the re what you were just actually mentioning as well, Representative Grad, that language about refraining from acquiring firearms in, in the future, uh, that's new, a new proposal from the, from the bill as introduced. But as well as this new language, there's a piece that's uh, not here and that you'll recall in the bill as introduced, uh, the relinquishment provision applied if the plaintiff's complaint or affidavit included information that the defendant had firearms. So, and the court had to find it necessary that the removal, uh, that removal was necessary to protect the plaintiff for the plaintiff's children. So we're, there were those two sort of prerequisites to the relinquishment order. One, that the, that the affidavit or complaint had information that the defendant had firearms and two, that removal was necessary for protection of the plaintiff for the plaintiff's children. So those aren't uh, in subdivision E, as I mentioned, E does come under one, so that there does have to be this finding of an immediate, immediate danger of further abuse. And there has to be, that in line 13, there has to be an affidavit submitted as well. But the difference is that the, that the affidavit and the finding of immediate further abuse, immediate danger of further abuse, don't necessarily have to specifically uh, reference firearms. They're more, more general than that. And that's the difference between H-133 as introduced and this one. And, the, and the, you may recall that that, uh, piece was proposed, the proposal was to remove that piece out of the, co the court's concern, and I'm sure Judge Grierson will talk about this in more detail, but it was done out of the court's concern that including it in there would limit uh, the court's existing authority. And it's important actually to understand this point because that sort of underlies uh, the entire proposal here. And, that, and that's that it is already court practice to include this firearms relinquishment requirement. This is done uh, quite commonly, and if my understanding from the judge is correct, uh, the judges are, are in agreement that uh, they have the authority to do this, and it's already practiced, is the point. This is essential. This bill is codifying, is putting in statute what is already court practice. Um, and this is done without uh, anything in law that I mentioned about the affidavit requiring showing that the that the defendant has firearms or that the court make findings that the removal removal of firearms is necessary uh, to protect the plaintiff so this removal is already done currently and those findings aren't required and that's why uh, I think the court was concerned that keeping those firearms in the in the language of the statute in the language of the bill would limit their existing authority because that would be putting uh, requirements uh, on the removal order that don't exist in current law. So it's a, it's a it sort of leads to a natural and fair question is, well, if the statute doesn't say anything about removal of firearms, where does that authority come from? Right? Where, if, if, the court, if the authority exists now, uh, which the uh, judges and judiciary agree that it does, uh, where does it come from? And the answer is it comes from the, in, the inherent powers of the judicial branch of government as, as an independent and co-equal branch of government. They're, inherent authority and power. And this is a, a concept that is uh, universally recognized that the judiciary has uh, some inherent authority just as the executive branch does and the legislative branch does. And of course, there, there certainly debate about what that inherent authority includes, but the fact that it exists is, is universally recognized by the United States Supreme Court, the Vermont Supreme Court, uh, courts throughout the country. Um, and I just uh, thought it would be helpful for the committee to hear. I was looking into it a little bit, and there's a, a nice statement about it. Uh, this is from a Nevada Supreme Court decision, 2007, describes it quite clearly. It says, the judiciary's inherent powers are derived from two sources, the separation of powers doctrine, 
And that's the idea that the, the judicial branch is an independent, co-equal branch of government that has some independent authority, independent of what statutes say. And two, the judiciary's sheer existence by virtue of the judicial functions expressly created under state constitutions. Again, that's the case in Vermont as well. The state, state constitution creates this judicial branch of government. And uh, it's, as the cases say, that it naturally comes along with in order to perform their functions that the constitution gives to the judicial branch, same way it gives functions to the executive and legislative branch, there's got to be some inherent authority to do uh, other necessary actions to perform those functions. Uh, this important proviso that I'll read that also from the case that a number of cases around the country have followed that up with this particular statement, which is that a court's inherent power should be exercised only when established methods fail or in an emergency situation. So that brings us back to the language because it's the emergency situation piece that uh, applies here. You know, these are these are emergency RFAs that can only be issued upon this finding of immediate potential future harm. So I don't want to put words in Judge Grierson's mouth, but but uh, you know that's the the position that makes sense under this this inherent power argument that it's an emergency situation. And in those emergency situations, uh, the court has an inherent authority uh, as an independent branch of government to essentially put what orders are necessary to protect uh, the, the parties who are there before the court in litigation. So that's just a little background to understand. It's important to understand that because that brings us uh, to the language, as I said, uh, this is putting in statute what is already the court's practice. And so from the court's perspective, obviously, it's going to be important that, that this new language be consistent with what current practice is. And that's why um, the language that I mentioned has been removed, that the, that the complaint and affidavit specifically talk about firearms or that the court make the specific finding about firearms removal. Uh, that isn't consistent with what the current practice is. So the proposal is that the language not be here. Uh, so, uh, and the language itself, as I say, is uh, basically three changes to the bill as introduced. The three are, one, it gets relocated from in the statute uh, so that it's now falls within subdivision one, which means you have this uh, requirement, I'll go right to it again, this requirement that there be a finding of immediate danger of further abuse. That's change number one. Change number two, uh, you've added in language uh, to refrain from acquiring firearms while the order is in effect. That's that last clause on line 14 and 15. And lastly, uh, the proposal is to strike that language about um, the affidavit and the court finding specifically related to firearms. Those are the three substantive changes uh, from the bill as introduced in this one right here, uh, the proposed amendment. One very last point that I'll add, and that's just because there's been a, a, a discussion in the committee as well about uh, constitutional due process requirements. And would those apply here? And, and the answer is certainly yes, they do. Uh, you, I'm sure you recall the, the due process clause of the United States Constitution and the comparable provision in the Vermont Constitution basically say it, it, you can, a person you know, cannot be deprived of uh, life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Uh, it doesn't mean a person can't be deprived of those things, but if, if it does happen by the government, there has to be due process of law. Uh, generally, that means notice and an opportunity to be heard, because here, as you can see, there is a deprivation happening there's a, a deprivation of a person's firearms uh, does occur as a result of this language. Now that could be the person relinquishes it, turns it over to a firearms dealer, uh, turns it over to a friend, could be law enforcement, takes possession of it. I mean, there's a variety of ways that it could happen, but however it happens, there certainly is a deprivation of the person's firearm that is only happening because the, the law requires it. So there is state action, uh, I think, depriving a person of property. So the question then is, all right, is there sufficient due process given that there, this deprivation is happening? And I think the answer to that is yes. Um, the key point here is that, uh, you know, generally speaking, when you talk about notice and an opportunity to be heard, the hearing has to be held pre-deprivation. That means, you know, before the property is deprived, that's when the person needs to have uh, an opportunity to have a hearing and argue about, well, here's why this shouldn't happen. Here you see that that doesn't happen. The fire, the fireman, which is the property in this case, uh, is uh, either relinquished or taken taken first, and the hearing comes afterward. It has to have within happen within 14 days after the deprivation. 
That's what's known as a post deprivation hearing. And those are permitted under, under constitutional due process requirements, as long as there is a prompt and meaningful hearing is what the court described it, a prompt and meaningful hearing afterward within a, a meaningful, reasonable period of time so that a person can still contest. In other words, you can't just take it and then you know, wait five years or some unreasonable long, long period of time before the person can come in and argue why it shouldn't happen. As long as there's this prompt, meaningful hearing, it's okay to have a, po a pre post deprivation hearing. And in this case, it has to be within 14 days. Uh, you know, the courts have, have upheld several months at, in other contexts. And um, they, they've been pretty, uh, pretty clear about not, not wanting to establish sort of a hard and fast time limit. So they're not gonna say, oh, 10 days is always okay, or 30 days is always okay. Um, so they sort of depends on the facts and circumstances, but with a maximum of 14 days here, I haven't seen any cases that that's uh, held that that sort of time period wasn't prompt enough. So, so that's why my view is that that uh, certainly due process is implicated. Certainly, it's a legitimate constitutional point. Uh, but the way I read the language, it it would uh, likely satisfy due process requirements uh, under current law. Um, you know, just the last point I'd mention is that uh, you know the, my point about under current law, you know. The property does involve firearms. You know that that is a, a, a unique point in that it's a constitutionally protected right. The individual right to to possess firearms under the Second Amendment is also constitutionally protected. So uh, you know this is a sort of currently evolving field of law. I haven't seen any cases that say well the standard would be different with respect to firearms, but that doesn't mean that that in the future um, that a court might reach that conclusion. You know there, I think. Um, the, the subject of firearms law is one in which we are bound to hear something about very soon, from, certainly from the Vermont Supreme Court, because as folks probably know, the, the uh, magazine limit that the legislature passed two years ago has been pending over at the Vermont Supreme Court. The constitutionality of that under Article 16 of the Vermont Constitution, that has been pending since, I think, oral argument. And it's two cases that were joined together. One of the oral, oral arguments was last July, and one of them was in November. So we're due an opinion from the Supreme Court and, and I'm sure that we'll have something to say about, about the, the right to possess firearms. And so, you know, in, in that sense, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned when I did my first explanation to the committee of what we as ledge counsel will say to you, I can't say for certain what, what the law around uh, of firearms possession in Vermont in particular may develop into. Uh, and it could be that that it's something um, that wouldn't affect this, but maybe not, we, we don't know. Um, I don't think anybody knows exactly how that's gonna turn out, but it's something I at least wanted to note, it, note for the committee uh, that uh, we'll probably hear more about that subject in the near future. So, but under current standards, under the current uh, due process standards, uh, my view is that, that the structure um, satisfies due process. So uh, that's my, Walk through for today, um, but I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions or to stop sharing the screen if you want to move to something else, Representative Grad, whatever you prefer. Great, thank you. Now that was, that was very helpful, Eric. I do see um, two hands. I see Martin and Chair. I just got. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I just got an email that our uh, committee page is down. Committee page is down. Okay, thank you. Uh, is I'm not sure if it's the YouTube or our uh, um, page well, online. Huh. We're still on, on YouTube. Um, I can't, I'm struggling to, um, I just can't even get to the legislative homepage. So I think it must just be a systemic thing that we're with the website, hopefully temporarily. Yeah, the documents page is well, that that's part of the whole thing, but it, it's accessible now. I just I just got through, but you know, the first couple of tries it didn't. Okay. So the YouTube, it's up on YouTube. It's just not up uh, through the legislative page somehow. But I just jumped. I think on it's back up now. Yeah, it's back up now. I, I went right to the agenda. So I think we're good. Okay, thank you. Okay, Martin and then uh, Felicia. Uh, so thank you, Eric. And um, I, I just had a question. So the, 
idea of the deprivation of various rights uh, with a relief from abuse order, uh, e even without the, the firearms component of it, there, there are rights of an individual that are being deprived, essentially, uh, being able to use their home, being able to contact their children. There, one could argue that there are certain rights related to uh, you know, freedom of assembly or freedom of religion or, you know, not that, but, but certainly of, of assembly. I mean, there's a lot of deprivations that occur already. So is that, I guess, is that correct? I mean, this is, this is, it's not anything new that all of a sudden we're having this deprivation of rights that um, courts haven't dealt with in other contexts with uh, relief from abuse orders. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's right. All right. Thanks. Uh, Felicia. Um, I just had a question for you, Eric. Uh, while you were signing cases, it seems that uh, there is a good foundation for requiring the defendant um, to be temporarily or permanently suspended from their rights, including um, their Second Amendment rights, but I still did not hear in any of that um, case law how that extends to other persons. So looking at the language, specifically lines 13 and 14 on page two, it seems that by saying in the defendant's possession, ownership or control would be sufficient and we don't need to include another person who's not a defendant and not named and not a part of this RFA. So can you give me any examples of areas of law that are currently in practice where an RFA would extend to a person outside of the defendant themselves? I deprive a person outside of the defendant, outside of the RFA, of their rights. In other words, it, it is, uh, am I right in understanding that it's uh, the, the person who might be holding a firearm on behalf of the defendant, but is not the defendant, him or herself, it's somebody else who might have it? So my point is in the language, we say the defendant's possession, ownership, or, or control. Right. Um, and to reiterate controls on behalf of the defendant, a line later seems redundant and, and a little clumsy because uh, it's looping in somebody completely unrelated. If we're going to intend that it's already inside control, why put that line in there and open it up to kind of that fishing expedition of who might have something that they could borrow? Because at the end of the day, it's, what does the defendant have have access to or control? And that should be the court's purview. I don't think that should start extending to what might somebody else have that they might have access to. So just I'm looking for examples of where in current law, as Martin was mentioning, defendants are already deprived of certain rights and liberties where in current law do we extend that deprivation outside of individuals stated in the RFA? Yes, well, I'll respond two ways to that. First, I don't know of any off the top of my head. <laughs> so I'd have to look into that further to see if there were other examples. But kind of to your point, and I think I'm seeing your point here uh, uh, more clearly, thanks for explaining it, um, that it's, it's kind of, a, I think if I'm understanding you right, that use of the word control the first time that are in the defendant's possession, ownership, or control already really would include uh, uh, if someone else were controlling it on behalf of the defendant, then almost by definition, then the, then the, then the defendant already controls it. So in that sense, maybe that second phrase is redundant, not really necessary. And uh, yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, uh, it may not be necessary because that term control could be read to include those situations anyway. Yeah, I appreciate um, your response on that. And it's kind of my personal opinion that let's be very, very clear with intent here. I think by saying control, we are being clear that 
if hypothetically I am the defendant in an RFA and I hand my sister all of my firearms, they're still in my control. But right. what we wouldn't be doing is having that hypothetical of who might I have access to their firearms. I do not want the implication in the law to be who has firearms that surround in the sphere of influence of the defendant. I want it to be the defendant's firearms or controlled firearms. If, if that's, I, I want to make sure we're splitting that hair precisely because that is the deprivation of one person's rights under an RFA or the deprivation of many. And I think being very clear on that is important to seeing if this is worth moving forward. Thank you. So, um, so thank you, Felicia, I appreciate that. So could, um, looking at that language, could you just give me an idea of what, what you would support in terms of what you would take out? If you could just read it, um, that'd be helpful. Sure. Um, so ending at the end of line 13 at control, I would remove or that another person possesses or controls on behalf of the defendant. Removing that removes a lot of ambiguity for me and it makes the language much easier to support. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, great. Other, uh, Bob. Yes, good morning, Eric. Good morning. So as I understand it, H-133 is an act relating to an emergency relief, relief from abuse order, uh, ex parte, correct? Yes, that's right. So the act in itself, along with uh, the amendments, are still based off this order where the decision is based upon the preponderance of an evidence and not clear and convincing? Yes, that's right. Okay, so having said that, uh, Judge Grierson, and he may be the one to answer this one, Eric, is uh, the courts already have this authority. And my question is, I guess, what seems to be commonplace now within our judicial system as far as judges ordering the relinquishment of firearms? Does it seem to be more or less within their immediate control within their household, or have they, have taken, have, have they taken that step to go outside and also look at these uh, this amendment, such as what we're looking at today. Uh, I, I think you're right. That's probably a good question for the judge. I'm not really sure in practice how that's how that's unfolded. You know, based on the particular facts of where the firearms might be in, in each individual RFA situation. Um, uh, but but uh, he might have a better answer for that. Thank you. You bet. Anybody else? Ken, I know you had questions. I don't know if um, if you're waiting to hear ask some of the witnesses or so make sure you're all set for now. Well, well, well some have been answered. Felicia put it much more eloquently than I did would. But I, I guess um, I'm going to ask this. Maybe, maybe I can't. Maybe I shouldn't. But Eric, if when a situation gets to this point, usually it's a pretty hostile environment between usually a a, a breakout a breakout situation. Usually, one party is probably more upset than the other or whatever, and you get a lot of end data, you get a lot of all kinds of stuff. If you have a party, if you have a so-called, I'm gonna say an innocent, if you have a, guy, a person that's involved that really isn't a threat with firearms and somebody wanted to portray them as a threat with their firearms, they could have those firearms taken away from a person 
or under somebody else's power for no reason at all that th that person didn't deserve that. And on top of that, this person that is going after this, these firearms could be with a, with a, with a person that could go under this guy after a person that can no longer protect himself. Correct? Did I make sense? Well, I, I think uh, as far as you know, the facts of each individual case. Again, I think I'll defer to Judge Pearson on that. I'll just say that the the whatever order the court makes under this statute, it does require a finding that there's an immediate danger of further abuse and that there's been pa past abuse. So th there's no, the court is limited by the language of the RFA statute from being able to issue this order unless it makes those findings. So uh, as to what people may say in court that may be true or may not be true, you know, that's something that happens in all court proceedings. So I, I can't speak to that, but or I should say that's a, always a possibility in any court proceedings. Not that it always happens, that sounds cynical, <laughs> but uh, it's always a possibility. Uh, uh, but uh, the findings that are required as a prerequisite for an RFA are laid out in the statute that there's been past abuse, there's an immediate danger of further abuse. And uh, uh, so I think the courts are, are used to applying those standards. So let me try it another way. A person is supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. If all this was to happen and a person was innocent, and somebody wanted to get the, a, a person, he has no way of defending himself. Well, so maybe with a kitchen knife or something like that, but he's not going to have be in possession of, of firearms. Right? I didn't follow that one. Sorry, Representative Gosselin. A person that has these firearms taken away from him and no no uh, way to to have them it is kind of a sitting duck for somebody that wanted to come after them that isn't yet proven a hundred percent that these firearms should be taken away from them. Uh, well, I kind of like I, I mentioned earlier. I think I'm gonna. I, I don't really get into those characterizations of what the statute means, but uh, uh, but um, I think the, the legal result of a firearms relinquishment order is that the person wouldn't have firearms anymore. That's, that's correct. So okay. I just that wanna make, Ken, I wanna make sure I understand. Are you, are you talking about, cause here we're talking about an emergency, an ex parte emergency order that that lasts up to 14 days. And that, that's the period we're, we're talking about. Are, are you focusing on that period? Or are you focusing on what happens that after? Period, but I'm focusing on, I guess the word that I'm, that I'm not used yet is the vendetta against somebody the vendetta against somebody. That's all. I'll just wait for for Judge Grierson to talk right now. Yeah, I Thank think it'd you. be helpful. Yeah, I think it'd be helpful to find out from Judge Grierson in terms of the um, again looking at the affidavit, the findings, and then and then that that actual hearing um, that takes place um, no more than fourteen days uh, when the defendant does have an opportunity, it, it you know, to appear and to. Uh, to put on evidence. Uh, and again, these are civil proceedings that should be noted as, as well. Um, okay, Any, anything else for Eric? No. Okay, well, thank you, Eric, as, as always. It's, it's very helpful. Um, so why don't sure. we take a 15 minute break? Oh, sorry, somebody. Oh. Um, why don't we take a 15 minute break and then we'll um, come back and... Uh...